The coronavirus pandemic is having a deep negative impact on nine out of ten British people with eating disorders. That's according to a study from Northumbria University today. It estimates that approximately one and a quarter million people in the UK have an eating disorder. The fallout from routines being disrupted in lockdown, a focus on food, exercise and health in public conversation and healthcare moving online could all have lasting effects, according to the research. Let's talk now to Dave Chawner. He was diagnosed as severely clinically anorexic at 23 and he's now in recovery. He's an author, comedian and ambassador for BEAT. That's an eating disorder charity. And also we've got Hope Virgo with us, an eating disorder campaigner who is in ongoing recovery. Hello both of you, thank you very much for talking to us. Um, nine out of ten people with eating disorders found lockdown particularly hard. Hope, I wonder if you could give us some reasons why. Um, so predominantly um, we're looking at things around the focus on exercise and the focus on food. So at, throughout lockdown all over social media we've seen people exercising left, right and centre and whilst for some people this might not feel that damaging, if you have an eating disorder that is extremely triggering. And the other thing that I think is really important to mention is also the uncertainty around lockdown, which when you have an eating disorder, it's that uncertainty that can be really, really dangerous. The eating disorder tries to pull you back in, trying to give you that sense of control through calorie counting, through controlling your exercise, and it gives you that sense of reassurance around that. And I think that for people with eating disorders, again, that uncertainty has just really caused so many people to become more concerned with their day-to-day -day lives around food. Mm. Dave, I wonder if you could uh, pick up on Hope's point about seeing everybody on social media doing exercise or taking up jogging or whatever it was they were doing, why that might be triggering. triggering. Can you give us some insight into that, please? Not really, because I'm terrible on social media. But oh, I think right, for, okay. me, for me, I think it's kind of like, I, I think one of the things that really gets me is that, like, look, there was a lot of insecurity around lockdown. People didn't know what was going on with their jobs, with furlough and stuff like that. Mm. And I don't think you wrap people up in cotton wool. And I think it's natural that people are looking for coping mechanisms. And a lot of the time people are looking for disease coping mechanisms. And if you're surrounded by food all of the time, that's constantly tempting you, you've got a restriction on the amount of exercise that you can do. Of course, you can a comfort eat. And the more you comfort eat, you feel guilty, you feel bad in your body. So then you need more comfort, you comfort eat, and it's a vicious cycle. And this is what a lot of people are seeing. Mm. Hope, why don't you give us some insight then about why, why seeing others exercising might, might be triggering for you? So eating disorders are really competitive illnesses. And I know at the height of my illness, I was competing with people around food and the amount of exercise I was doing. And so when I see people on social media constantly kind of showing what they're doing, you have a lot of Instagram lives kind of 24 seven actually. And it's causing people to feel like they need to be exercising that much. I think the other thing that it's doing, which is really triggering, is it's normalizing exercising obsessively in your home. So you have uh, sessions which are back to back and are so easy to tune into. And I've had hundreds of people contact me over lockdown who are just so unsure about that and finding it so difficult to navigate, wondering how much exercise they should be doing. Should they be doing any whatsoever? Shouldn't they be doing it? And again, it just creates this battle in your head trying to work out whether what you're doing is healthy or not. Mm. That's the first time I've ever heard that hope that eating disorders are very competitive, uh, which is uh, chilling in one sense, but also useful to know for mm. learning more about this. Dave, let me ask you as well. I mean, many, many people in the last few months will have obviously not been going into offices or their normal workplaces and they'll be having Zoom meetings. Is that another area because you can actually see yourself on Zoom and it's so annoying? It's so annoying and it also looks terrible. Nobody looks good on Zoom. You look like a depressed tomato. So I think that that has a very real impact as well as increased time on social media. But I also don't want to massively reduce this and say that social media is the devil. No, I no, no. Also other factors at play because this is a, a mental illness this isn't kind of like about vanity and sort of looking at instagram and stuff i think that generally exactly like hope said eating disorders being very competitive kind of really stem on people's low self-esteem and i think there's enough of that washing around with people losing their jobs losing family members and losing any sense of control so if there is somebody watching right now and i'd like to ask you both this who 
is struggling with an eating disorder and has struggled, found it really hard for all the reasons that we've just been describing, what would you suggest, Dave? I would firstly suggest Beat at the UK's Eating Disorder Charity. They are brilliant and they have so much help and resources. You've also got the Hub of Hope as well as Male Voice ED for blokes that are suffering with eating disorders. But I'd say, look, it's okay, you know? You don't have to freak out. You can recover from an eating disorder. And it takes time and that's okay. But I would sort of start to realize what's underpinning that. Because it's actually eating disorders aren't really about food at all. Food is the outlet in the same way that any sort of addiction is. What would you say, Hope? Um, I would firstly remind them that they're not alone in how they're feeling. There are so many people who will be struggling with similar things. Um, and I always suggest actually going to your GP as a first point of call. So make that initial contact with your GP. Yes, quite often the GP will turn that person away. There might not be support in place, but actually be persistent around that. And then I always say as well, like, go back to the basics if that what's works for you. I know at the start of lockdown, I actually found the first kind of two weeks quite challenging. And I went back to having quite a strict routine around my meal times. I made sure that I had a start and finish of my day. And I also spoke to people around me. So kind of texted my mum, spoke to my boyfriend, like making sure that actually I had that support network there. And I do think that there is support out there, as Dave says, professional support. So if you do need that additional support, never, ever, ever feel ashamed about reaching out for it. Because the fact is they are really serious illnesses mm -hmm. and it's hard work. And sometimes it is about just plugging away at it every single day and pushing those boundaries and challenging yourself to just keep going. And the feelings pass. Thank you very much, Hope Virgo. Dave Chawner, really appreciate your insight and your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you.